Welcome to Storytelling Live. It's been quite a week. I <clears throat> have been reaching my wits end, personally. Um, and I was able to sort of tap out and go to a friend's property for the most part of the uh, week. Um, which was cool and fun. And uh, the property, I say property, because they have a cabin at the back end of the property amongst uh, the trees and the bushes and uh, passing peacocks every once in a while. It was so, so amazing. There's no electricity. Uh, I go into the main house for a bathroom or a shower. And then I brought my rice cooker. Hey, Veronica, how are you? How are you? Um, uh, they give me a, a... I brought my rice cooker and I just made like little sandwiches and... How are you? It's been a weird week. Um, yeah. Uh, I asked if I could see the debates while I was there and um, we watched it. They're seniors there. I mean, you know, they've seen a lot of things. I've seen some things, but we'd never seen anything like that. I don't think anyone ever has seen anything like that. It was like a blur of two old white guys going at it. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Well, that happened. So how many people are uh, in California? I'm in California. We have 13 propositions uh, on the uh, uh, ballot. I took a, today's my Saturday, today's Saturday, right? I mean, here we are again, it's Saturday. I took, uh, I must have taken about three hours to study each proposition, for real, because I want to know what's going on. Internet privacy? <clears throat> yeah, hey Mike. Yeah, hey Veronica, yeah, you are. Internet privacy? It's bankrolled by one person. I don't know if that person has our everyone's best interest in mind. And I don't know what the uh, stipulations, it sounds like a good thing, but there might be weird stipulations written into that. I did not read the full text of the bill. I mean, I read it and I read several, a few, not several. On each one, I probably read one or two auxiliary articles to try to inform myself a little bit better without reading the entire text because why I might head start spinning. Things are knocked out. I don't understand legalese. I can understand a summary, you know, but, uh, hey, Paul, what's happening? Um, so, yeah, I studied uh, the ballot for about three hours today. That was incredible. It was good, though. I mean, it has to happen. It has to happen. I don't know how the people in San Francisco are doing. I mean, I, I mean, if I've, if I'm in... A small town and I'm looking at you know 22 propositions I wonder what they've got going on in the Bay Area you know geez um, let me see here so everyone just vote okay vote please I know there are arguments against voting um, let's figure that out next year okay let's everyone just this year just on a lark, on a whim, get down there and vote for your conscience. Uh, anyway, um, let me see. I've got notes. I've got notes. I've been saving things up to say to you all week long. I've been thinking about tonight. And uh, it helps me to do this. And I hope it helps you guys too. Um, it's fun. It's fun to read this Jekyll and Hyde stuff. It's all full of of modern mythology. It's full of things that still affect our society today. You would think they wouldn't. 
but it's definitely the underpinnings of uh, American society. Um, let me see. I wanted to tell you that a few weeks ago... <laughs> thank you, Veronica. Uh, I wanted to tell you a few weeks ago on a hot day in August, I leaned over to tie my shoe and now it's October. Still no sight of rain. A few hundred wildfires later with millions of acres burned. That's bad, but that's the truth. That's what's happening here in California. I heard a new statistic today. I'm not sure if this is true or false or whatever. Find it out, find it out. Over 100 people in demonstrations were struck. Hi, Susan, how are you? Good to see you here. Hello. There's a new statistic, over a hundred people uh, in demonstrations have been struck by cars since the George Floyd protests. And that's about three months, right? So about 30 people a month are being hit by cars in protests. It's a clash. It's the thrill of the crash that is reminds me of the uh, who's that guy who did scanners and he did naked lunch? Uh, oh my god, I, I should have noted it before. The director, he made uh, a movie about called Crash, not the other movie called Crash, but he made a movie called Crash, and it was about the ecstasy of impact. And that's really what uh, is kind of going on. It's, I mean, there's, there are, I mean, demonstrations need to happen, and if there's no justice, there can be no peace. So, for true, for real, uh, and and um, but this is an ideological war, and there I don't know if physical conflict is going to solve an ideological matter, and so I think that it's also the time that this decade is telling us this this period of time is telling us to go inward and to explore inward and to find our true tribe well to find our true self first and to figure out what we bring to the table and to clean that up if you're bringing a mess to the table then it's not going to work but if you're bringing a coherent message to the table then that is your true nature your true self and honor that and and I, I i honor that in you and hopefully you will honor that in me and this is how we progress into the future it's also through voting uh for city council whoever the little baby government peoples are vote from the real small onto the real big you know encourage change through politics by showing up by representing <clears throat> um and by knowing yourself and by knowing your clan, your tribe, your squad, the mod squad, right? Crash, Cronenberg. Well, it, every time I'm on the, every time I'm on, you know, <laughs> thank you, Jay. <laughs> uh, every time I'm on the camera, I'm like, you know, I space out. So it's like, duh, what was I going to say? Because, you know, this is heat. This is smog. Um, let me let me get to the smog in a minute because I want to talk about London streets and our smog today. It was eighty degrees here and no sky, just slate. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I looked for the sun maybe a little bit, but not much, man. It was like a gray sky. It just didn't seem the light didn't seem to change all day until it was night. Now it's night. What I want to talk about is just another couple few little words about dualism and why it figures so heavily uh, in our politics. I mean, I don't understand why we don't have multiplicity in our politics. It just seems to get drowned out. I believe that there is a kind of a thrill of the shock of dualism. This is like, well, if, it, if you're not a this, then you're probably a that. 
No, I'm not necessarily a that. I mean, politically, well, private message me for actual real po political talk. This is fake political talk here. This is not real political talk. Um, this is nothing of absolute substance. But what, we're, what I'm saying to you is that there is a particular thrill in people, in cultures, of seeing things in extreme terms. And it's actually very toxic. It's a toxic way of thought. It's like a meme. Um, uh, it reminds me of a uh, documentary I watched uh, years ago called The Power of Nightmares by uh, Adam Curtis. And if you ever see uh, Adam Curtis uh, uh, documentaries uh, uh, listed somewhere, and you haven't seen it yet, you should probably see an Adam Curtis uh, documentary because he's talking about the clash of duality, the clash of the two sides, when the two sides are fundamentalists versus their fundamentalists. And boom, then there's this great co you know, collision and fireworks for everyone to watch and snack on your popcorn to watch the sky light up in fire. You know, it's like, you know, I'm through with that kind of a thing. It's, it, it's sort of a morbid uh, fascination, right? But we can step away, we can step back from that and uh, step back into ourselves and step back into who we are and what we actually represent rather than just be a, an observer waiting with the, you know, in the peanut gallery, you know, waiting for our, our dose of popcorn to be handed to us, you know, by someone else, right? You know, it's someone else's game. Watch it when the press does that, watch it. Cause they're like keying everything up. They're like, here it's a boxing match. Here it's a civil war. Here it's a this and versus that. Yeah, no, no, no. This illusion, illusion. Um, I think that uh, I'm not studied in Zen, but I think that the uh, study of duality deserves more attention uh, because it is not, it probably does not actually only mean like two halves, you know, a black half and a white half, you know. It's just bizarre. It's bizarre. So dualism works its way because it's in culture, works its way into language. So therefore, language itself is fallible. And it's a trap, and it's an identity trap for those people who only believe what they are told in their language, and they have a trouble describing themselves, because I'm neither this nor that. And now we're talking about identity. Am I this or am I that? Well, you can be anything. You could be the other thing. You could be any one of 30 million other things. Let's just be one of those, and let's grow that, because the old camps are worn out and they're non-productive, and uh, I, this, this time, this new era, is for finding the self, finding your squad, and um, forging a new way with them. It's not about, yay, cool, let's figure out who we are and then join up with the old crap we've always been into. Mm -mm, no, can't do that anymore. Anyway. That's a little bit of that, and that's a little bit of me uh, on duality, the, the shock, the thrill of the shock of duality, and, and uh, how confusing it can be for identity and for real things, for human things, because we are multiplicities. I mean, we could be liberal, you know, and multiplicitous, you know. I mean, that's, I'm not saying that, you know, if you're multiplicitous that you're you know, you can't be exactly who you are. You're even more dialed into you. There are Bruce Springsteen's 57 channels and nothing on. There, there are 100, there are 30 million channels and everything is on now. Everything is on. There's something exactly for you. There is your tribe waiting exactly for you in the wings or in front of your face. Acknowledge them, embrace them, and share your love with them. And don't save it anymore. Don't save it for anything. Okay, our skies were crazy. Our skies in California were weird and crazy and the wind blew it out, blew it back in. Wine country's on fire. Uh, this is gonna affect our economy for real. The animals are dying, the plants are dying. Not many people, about 30, 30 or 40 people dying. Lots of property. Lots of money going straight up. Everything you thought was important. You might not have noticed that you had a photo album 
that had, you know, a you know, like back from your were when you were a teenager or a little child or whatever, whatever. It's gone now. It's burnt, and you can't go home, and your property's worth nothing. Uh, and that's what these people are going through. It's dire, dire, dire times for millions and millions of people. It's bad. So, the air, I wanted to talk about more about, like, how London streets were actually built. I was re trying to research that today, like, to try to show you some examples of, of how it was like, you know, they had streets... But then they built things out onto the street, and then things were, like, built improvisationally on top of that. And then so you got weird passageways and tunnels and stuff in streets and weird coves and alleys. That's how it was. Let me get back to my notes. Our California skies are still choked with the smoke of hundreds of thousands of acres burned, animals and farms, yes, yes. Amber skies... Yes, yes. So, London streets, in a similar way, were consistently filthy, convoluted. There were pickpockets out there. They were dangerous. Uh, the, the, oh, filthy. I wanted to talk about filth. They called it mud. That was a euphemism. The streets were filled with mud. That's a euphemism. They had, like, uh, hundreds of thousands of horses and, and dog-drawn carriages and, and human waste flying through the streets as well. But mostly it was... Horse apples, just creating a slick layer of goo <laughs> all over the city, man. Wow. Um, PU, right? So, uh, pickpockets, the Ripper was out there at the time. Um, the most, however, the most feared avenue or method or modality of death uh, for the average Londoner was poisoning. So everyone was fearing being poisoned, not attacked by brigands in the street, not pickpocketed to death, uh, and definitely not uh, surgically uh, altered to death uh, by the Ripper, but um, good old-fashioned poisoning, arsenic and old lace, right? It's curious. To me, I want to talk to you about that. Just poisoning. The streets were noisy. And the, no the noise uh, that the huge overloaded buses made was a contribution to the general din on the streets, which all visitors remarked upon. And one resident of a side street uh, noted that the everlasting sound of men, women, children, omnibuses, carriages, street coaches, wagons, carts, dog carts, steeple bells, doorbells was going on and, and just... Uh, that was the concert of of uh, London at the time. Uh, the omnibuses uh, charged very, very little, and the drivers made very, very little, but they made uh, more money if the bus was packed. So the driver was not encouraged to uh, skip stops. They picked up people from every stop. So those buses were loaded, loaded with people. Loaded down. Loaded. And, uh, I don't know how they survived. Uh, I, I prefer a cold smog to a hot smog any day. Uh, today we had hot smog. I'm noticing a bit of, uh, visual distortion on my monitor. And so uh, it's possible that the airwaves are not so kind to us tonight, but uh, we will uh, forge right ahead with the broadcast. So um, here's a quote from Charles Dickens about London at the time. As the east wind brings up the exhalations of the Essex and Kentish marshes, and does D and as the damp laden winter air, this is J Dickens, prevents the dispersion of the partly consumed carbon from hundreds of thousands of chimneys, the strangest atmospheric compound known to science fills the valley of the Thames, 
At such times, almost all the senses have their share of trouble. And not only does a strange and worse and Sumerian darkness hide familiar landmarks from the sight, but the taste and smell are offended by an unhallowed compound of flavor, and all things become greasy and clammy to the touch during the continuance of a real London fog, which may be black or gray or more probably orange colored. The happiest man is he who can stay at home. Nothing could be more deleterious to the lungs and the air passages than the wholesale inhalation of the foul air and floating carbon, which combined form the London fog. There you go. That's Dickens. Here's an, an anonymous person says, soon after daybreak, the great factory shafts beside the river begin to discharge immense volumes of smoke, and their clouds soon become confluent, and then the sky is overcast with a dingy veil. The house chimneys presently add their contributions, and by 10 o'clock a.m., as one approaches London from any hill in the suburbs, one may observe the total result of this gigantic nuisance hanging over the city like a pall. P-A-L-L, -L, for those of you named Paul, it's P-A-L-L. -L. The fog created twilight in many areas of town, and street lamps were sometimes kept lit throughout the day because the streets were so dark. This is from Wikipedia. The smoky atmosphere meant that skin and clothing were quickly dirtied just by walking on the street. Household upholsteries, artwork, and furniture could become irretrievably dirty, requiring large contingents of servants in the more prosperous house households to maintain cleanliness. The preoccupation with the exorbitant laundry bills which resulted from the smoke was a main factor in legislating to control smoke emissions in London through the Smoke Nuisance Abatement and Metropolis Act of 1853. In the debates surrounding the passage of this act, it was estimated that a working-class mechanic in London paid five times the cost of purchasing his dirt to launder it. The grass of the royal parks took on a permanent soot color, as did the sheep that were, at the time, allowed to graze in Regent's Park and Hyde Park. It was observed that certain varieties of flower refused to bloom in London or its vicinity, and many trees perished due to pollution. One of the trees that was resistant to the smoky environment was the London plane tree, which sheds its bark regularly and thus resisted the accumulation of soot, which killed other trees. It became the go-to planting along streets and in gardens throughout the 19th century. Porous brick and stone were quickly blackened with soot and effect worsened during bad fogs and damp weather, creating a uniform dinginess among London's buildings. And there you have it. London. Of, as this tale says, 18 with a long hyphen, uh, M dash. 18 something something. And so that brings us to Dr. Lanyon's narrative. <clears throat> On the 9th of January, now four days ago, I received by the evening delivery a registered envelope addressed in the hand of my colleague and old school companion, Dr. Henry Jekyll. I was a good deal surprised by this, for we were by no means in the habit of correspondence. I had seen the man, dined with him, indeed, the night before, and I could imagine nothing in our intercourse that should justify formality of registration. The contents increased my wonder, for this is how the letter ran. 10th of December, 18-something-something. Dear Lanyon, you are one of my oldest friends, and although... We may have differed at times on scientific questions. I cannot remember, at least on my side, any break in our, in our affection. There was never a day when, if you had said it to me, Jekyll, my life, my honor, my reason, depend upon you. I would not have sacrificed my left hand to help you. Lanyon, my life, my honor, my reason are all at your mercy. If you fail me tonight, 
I am lost. You might suppose after this preface that I'm going to ask you for something dishonorable to grant. Judge for yourself. I want you to postpone all other engagements for tonight. A. Even if you were summoned to the bedside of an emperor uh, to take a cab, unless your carriage should be actually at the door, and with this letter in your hand for consultation, to drive straight to my house. Poole, my butler, has his orders. You will find him waiting your arrival with a locksmith. The door of my cabinet is then to be forced, and you are to go in alone. To open the glazed press, letter E, on the left hand, breaking the lock if it be shut, and to draw out with all its contents as they stand, the fourth drawer from the top, which is the same thing, the third from the bottom, uh, or the, it's the same thing as the third from the bottom. In my extreme distress of mind, I have a morbid fear of misdirecting you, but even if I am in error, you might, you may know the right drawer by its contents, some powders, a file, a paper book, this drawer, I beg of you to carry it back with you to Cavendish Square exactly as it stands. And that's the first part of this service. And now for the second. You should be back if you set out at once on the receipt of this long before midnight. But I will leave you to that amount of margin, not only in the fear of those of one of those obstacles that can neither be prevented nor foreseen, but because... An hour when your servants are in bed is to be preferred for what you will then remain to do. At midnight, then, I have to ask you to be alone in your consulting room, to admit with your own hand into the house a man who will present himself in my name, and to place his hand in his hands the drawer that you will have brought with you from my cabinet. Then you will have played your part and earned my gratitude completely. Five minutes afterward, if you insist upon an explanation, you will have understood that these arrangements are of capital importance and that by the neglect of one of them, fantastic as they must appear, you might have charged your conscience with my death or the shipwreck of my reason. Confident as I am that you will not trifle with this appeal, my heart sinks in my hand, trembles at the bare thought of such a possibility. Think of me at this hour in a strange place laboring under a blackness of distress that no fancy can exaggerate and yet well aware that if you will but punctually serve me, my troubles will roll away like a story that is told. Serve me, my dear Lanyon, and save your friend, H.J. Henry Jekyll. P.S. I had already sealed this up when a fresh terror struck upon my soul. It is possible that the post office may fail me, and this letter may not come into your hands until tomorrow morning. In that case, dear Lanyon, do my errand when it shall be most convenient for you in the course of the day, and at once more expect my messenger at midnight. It may then already be too late, and if that night passes without event, you will know that you have seen the last... Of Henry Jekyll. Upon the reading of this letter, I made sure my colleague was insane. But till that was proved beyond the possibility of doubt, I felt bound to do as he requested. The less I understood of this farrago, the less I was in a position to judge of its importance, and an appeal so worded could not be set aside without a grave responsibility. I rose accordingly from table, got into a hansom, and drove straight to Jekyll's house. The butler was awaiting my arrival, and he had received by the same post as mine a registered letter of destruction, of instruction, and had sent at once for locksmith and carpenter. The tradesmen came while we were yet speaking, and we moved into a body, and we moved in a body to old Denman's surgical theater, which, as you are doubtless aware, uh, that's Currently, Dr. Denman's surgical theater is currently Jekyll's private cabinet, and it is most conveniently entered. The door was very strong, the lock excellent. The carpenter vowed he would have great trouble and have to do much damage if force were to be used, and the locksmith was near despair, but this last was a handy fellow, and after two hours' work, the door stood open. 
The press marked E, it was unlocked, and I took out the drawer, had it filled up with straw and tied in a sheet, and returned with it to Cavendish Square. Here, I proceeded to examine its contents. The powders were neatly enough made up, but not, without the, not with the nicety of the dispensing chemist, so that it was plain they were of Jekyll's private manufacture. And when I opened one of the wrappers, I found what seemed to me to be a simple crystalline salt of white-colored vial to which I had next turned my attention might have been about half full of a blood-red liquor, which was highly pungent to the sense of smell and seemed to me to contain phosphorus and some other volatile ether. At the other ing ingredients I could make no guess. The book was an ordinary version. This is the book was an ordinary version book and contained little but a series of dates. These covered a period of many years, but I observed that the entries ceased nearly a year ago and quite abruptly. Here and there, a brief remark was appended to a date, usually no more than a single word, double, recurring, perhaps <clears throat> six times, in a total of several hundred entries, and once a very early once very early in the list and followed by several marks of exclamation, TOTAL FAILURE! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. All this, though it whetted my curiosity, told me little that was definite. And here were a file of some salt and the record of a series of experiments that had led, like too many of Jekyll's investigations, to no end of practical useless usefulness. How could the presence of these articles in my house affect either the honor the sanity or the life of my flighty colleague. If his messenger could go to one place, why could he not go to another? And even if granting some impediment, why was this gentleman to be received by me in secret? The more I reflected, the more I convinced, the more convinced I grew that I was dealing with a case of cerebral disease. And though I dismissed my servants to bed, I loaded an old revolver that I might be found in some posture of self-defense. Twelve o'clock had scarce rung, over, rung out over London. Twelve o'clock midnight. Ere the locker, the knocker, sounded gent very gently on the door. I went myself at the summons found a small man crouching against the pillars of the portico. Are you from Dr. Jekyll? I asked. He told me, yes, by a constrained gesture. And when I had bidden him enter, he did not obey me without a searching backward glance into the doctor's square. <clears throat> there was a policeman, not far off, advancing with his bull's eye open, and at the sight, I thought my visitor started and made greater haste. These particulars struck me, I confess, disagreeably, and as I followed him into the bright light of the consulting room, I kept my hand ready on my weapon. Here, at last, I had a chance of clearly seeing him. I had never set eyes on him before, so much was certain. He was small, as I have said, and I was struck besides with the shocking expression of his face, with his remarkable combination of great muscular activity and the great apparent debility of constitution, at last but not least with the odd subjective disturbance caused by his neighborhood. This bore some resemblance to incipient rigor and was accompanied by a marked sinking of the pulse. At the time, I set it down to some idiosyncratic personal distaste and merely wondered at the acuteness of the symptom, but I had since had reason to believe the cause to lie much deeper in the nature of man and to turn on some nobler hinge than the principle of hatred. This person who had thus, from the first moment of his entrance, struck in me what I could only describe as a disgustful curiosity, was dressed in a fashion that would have made an ordinary person laughable, 
his clothes, that is to say, although they were of rich and sober fabric, were enormously too large for him in every measurement, the trousers hanging on his legs, rolled up to keep them from the ground, the waist of the coat, blows haunches, and the collar sprawling wide upon his shoulders. Strange to relate, the ludicrous accoutrement was far from moving me to laughter, rather as it was something abnormal and misbegotten than the very essence of the creature that now faced me, something seizing, surprising, and revolting. This fresh disparity seemed but to fit in with and to reinforce it, so that my interest in the man's nature and character there was added to curiosity as to his, inter, uh, to his origin, his life, his fortune, and his status in the world. These observations, though they had taken so great a space to be set down in, were yet the work of a few seconds. My visitor was indeed on fire with somber excitement. Have you got it? Have you got it? He cried, and so lively was, it, was his impatience that he even laid his hand upon my arm and sought to shake me. I put him back, conscious of his touch. There's a certain icy pang along my blood. Come, sir, said I. You forget that I have not yet the pleasure of your acquaintance. Be seated, if you please. And I showed him an example and sat myself down in my customary seat, and uh, with as fair an Im imitation of my ordinary manner to be to a patient uh, as the lateness of the hour, the nature of my preoccupations, and the horror I had of my visitor, would suffer me to muster. I beg your pardon, Dr. Lanyon. He replied civilly enough, What you say is very well founded, and my impatience has shown its heels to my politeness. I come here at the assistance, at the insistence of your colleague, Dr. Henry Jekyll, on a piece of business of some moment, and I understood. He paused and put his hand to his throat. And I could see, in spite of his collected manner, <clears throat> that he was wrestling against the approaches of the hysteria. Uh, I understood a drawer, but here I took pity on my visitor's suspense. Oh, said so the visitor, said it. I understood a, a drawer. But here I took pity on my visitor's suspense and some, perhaps, on my own curiosity. There it is, sir, said I, pointing to the drawer, where it lay on the floor behind a table and still covered with the sheet. He sprang to it and then paused, and then laid his hand upon his heart. I could hear his teeth great with the convulsive action of his jaws, and his face was so ghastly to see that I grew alarmed both for his life and reason. Compose yourself, said I. He turned a dreadful smile to me, and as if with the decision of despair, plucked away the sheet. At the sight of the contents, he uttered one loud sob of such immense relief that I saw that I sat petrified. <laughs> at the end, at the next moment, in a voice that was already fairly well under control, "Have you a graduated class?" Have you a graduated gloss? He asked. I rose from my place with something of an effort and gave him what he asked. He thanked me with a smiling nod. Hola, Rosana, mi querida. Uh, espero que podemos uh, hablarnos un poco en un rato, uh, en el futuro muy próximo. Okay. So, uh, he thanked, I rose from my place with something of an effort and gave him what he asked. He thanked me with a smiling nod, measured out a few minims of the red tincture and added one of the powders. The mixture, which was at first of a reddish hue, began in proportion as the crystals melted to brighten in color to effervesce audibly and to throw off small fumes of vapor. Suddenly, and at the same moment, the ebullition ceased, and the compound changed to a dark purple, which faded again more slowly 
toward her green. My visitor, who had watched these metamorphoses with keen eyes, smiled, set down the glass upon the table, and then he turned and looked upon me with an air of scrutiny. Scrutiny. And now, said he, to settle what remains, will you be wise? Will you be guided? Will you suffer me to take this glass in my hand and go forth from your house without further parley? Or, as a greed of curiosity, too much command of you? Think before you answer, for it shall be done as you decide. As you decide, you shall be left as you were before, and neither richer nor wiser, unless the sense of service, when rendered a man in mortal distress, rendered to a man in mortal distress, may be counted as a kind of riches of the soul. Or, if you shall so prefer to choose, a new province of knowledge and new avenues to fame and power shall be laid upon you here in this room upon the instant in your sight shall be blessed by prodigy to stagger the unbelief of satan sir said i affecting coolness that was that i was far from truly possessing you speak enigmas and you will perhaps not wonder that i hear you with no very strong impression of belief but i have gone too far in the way of inexplicable services to pause before i see the end it is well, replied my visitor. Lanyon, you remember your vows. What follows is under the seal of our profession. And now, you who have so long been bound to the most narrow and material views, you who have denied virtues transcendental medicine, you who have derided your superiors, behold! He put the glass to his lips and he drank the whole thing in one gulp. A cry followed. Oh, he reeled, staggered, clutched at the table, and held on, staring, with injected eyes grasping with an open mouth. And as I looked, there came, I thought, a change. He seemed, he seemed to swell. His face became so suddenly black, and the features seemed to melt and alter. And at the next moment, I had sprung to my feet and leaped back against the wall, my arms raised to shield me from that prodigy, my mind submerged in terror. Oh, God, I screamed, and oh, God, again and again, for there, before my eyes, pale, pale and shaken and half fainting and groping before him with his hands like a man restored from death, there stood Henry Jekyll. What he told me in the next hour, I cannot bring my mind to sit on paper. I saw what I saw. I heard what I heard. And my soul sickened at it. And yet now, when that sight had faded from my eyes, I asked myself if I believe it. And I still cannot answer. My life is shaken to its roots. Sleep has left me. The deadliest terror sits by me at all hours of the day and night, and I feel that my days are numbered, and that I must die, and yet I shall die, incredulous, as for the moral inter as for the moral turpitude that man unveiled to me. Even with tears of penitence, I cannot, even in memory, dwell on it without a start of horror. I will say but one thing, Utterson, and that, if you can bring your mind to credit it, that will be more than enough. The creature who crept into my house that night was, on, doc on Dr. Jekyll's own confession, known by the name of Hyde, and hunted for, in every corner of the land, as a murderer of Carew, signed respectfully, hasty Lanyon.
that concludes the testimony of Dr. Lang. How are we doing out there in Facebook land? I think things are dropping. I'm not sure where they're going. It's all dark in here. I have no idea what's going on. <sighs> Take a moment to refresh your drink. <clears throat> Take a moment to refresh yourself. Take a moment to have a powder. Uh, still the full moon. I mean, I guess, uh, we had a full moon, uh, I guess the day was like, was it yesterday or something? I, you know, <laughs> I'm not good at days anymore. I'm good at the continuum. Anyway. Susan, maybe you've got a sweet drink going. I hope you do. Hope you're out there. Jay, Jay, we got to do something together, some kind of jam, got to jam on something. Um, Veronica, I'm always glad you're out there. Thank you so much. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, today's October 3, yesterday was October 2, October 2, that was the full moon. Uh, but it's still full, full moon, you know, three days before, three days after. Um, my friend Adam wanted me to mention that uh, it's uh, October 2 is, um, hey Michael, yeah, right, I'm old, I'm old enough. But, um, <laughs> yeah, this is good, good. No, I'm gonna, I got a little more, we're gonna read a little bit more of Henry Jekyll, uh, but I just wanted to mention that October 2 was uh, Groucho Marx's 108th. Join the club and not do Yeah, my drink tonight. <laughs> Stella! Yay, Stella Cider. I love that. I love that. Thank you. I can just say yes to that right now. Yay. Thank you, Susan. I'll get to the rest of all your comments uh, probably in the morrow, in the morning. Um, but uh, so um, East Coasters, I'm afraid I'm a, I'm not afraid. I am very happy to see you with us, East Coast people. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's eleven o'clock at night for y'all. So sheesh. Wow. Thanks for staying up later. Um. So, Groucho Marx's uh, birthday was October 2, and I believe it was, uh, let me see, what do we got? Michael, how am I doing? I'm doing okay. I'll talk to you about it later. Let me look this text up. Just, there's uh, something, something, somebody sent me in a text, said it was... The uh, 100 and no, it was actually on last week's <laughs> that was a comment on last week's uh storytelling live. Uh, I think it's 108 or I don't know, really. NorCal Noise Fest. Oh my god, what's going on? Oh, NorCal Noise Fest. You mean is that a music festival? Uh. Hey, saludos, Jocelyn. Encantado de estar aquí. Muy, muy, muy bien, muy fuerte. Si comprendes, si comprendes bastante uh, inglés, es uh, muy fascinante. Uh, Nuestra historia para la noche. This is the el tercero semana, tercera semana. The, um, yeah, really, noise fest, right on. So it's a rock and roll, rock and roll, cool. Uh, I love that, man, but I'm not a fan of crowds, man. But I do SF bands, uh, I used to like A Minor Forest, uh, they were crazy cool. Um, but SF bands, uh, the famous and the best and the most rockinest of them all is probably the Dwarves, but they were kind of... <laughs> Silly, if you like that silliness, I don't know. I mean, they, they were exploitative, and uh, 
Anyway, but uh, let's um, let's let's skip ahead. So I've saved the juicy meat. Well, actually, Steve, uh, uh, Stevenson uh, saved the juiciest meat for the last. This is the last passage in the text, and we cannot get through it tonight. We can only get a few pages in, and judging uh, by my monitor, uh, uh, tonight's video might be kind of crappy for people to rewatch. so it's best that I keep it short, uh, shorter than other nights. We can party, we can party down on other ni on nights to come. Um, if you're following Storytelling Live, then you already know kind of what's in the future. I will tell you quickly, uh, we're going to do this. We might have a nice little uh, detective case coming up. And then after that, perhaps a ghost for Christmas. And uh, thereabouts in between will be Moroccans in space. Sounds silly. But it's a great and a charming and a tragic story that I wrote myself. So that'll be question mark weeks. Those are coming up. Everything is net. Oh, it's in the net. Really? Oh, cool. Okay. No crowds. How wonderful. Crank that rock and roll, Veronica. Crank it. Rock out. I love it. I love good rock and roll, man. Um... Uh, what was I going, I was saying something, but anyway, so, uh, so it's like, we're going to have a detective story, then we're going to have like, uh, around Christmas time, I think I'm going to try to have a Christmas ghost, but maybe between there, uh, we'll try to fit in, uh, some question mark nights, which means, um, uh, uh, my own, uh, uh, story, uh, with Moroccans in space, it's going to be beautiful. And tragic and sad and gorgeous. It's a, it's a lovely story. Um, after that is uh, uh, we're going to end up in the new year with um, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. We're going to talk about um, Lake Geneva. We're going to talk about the Romantic Poets. We're going to talk about uh, also the first was that the first? I think that was the first vampire tale also came from that Lake, Lake Geneva. Um, it was Mary Shelley and Percy and Polidori. So Polidori and, of course, uh, mm, mm, mm. Byron. Byron was there. Keats was not there. Keats was not there. I don't think he was there. Polidori was there. And Polidori wrote uh, the first... Uh, well, Walpole. Okay, so in the 1700s, Walpole wrote uh, The Castle of Toronto. But anyway, um, New Year, we will be having uh, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, Shelley's um, uh, uh, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus by the New Year. I didn't think I would ever be going on this long. I did not think that, I mean, none of us thought that COVID would be affecting us this long. We're probably looking at uh, something severe coming. I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's hard to not, you know, ascribe to this thrill, thrillism uh, perpetrated by the media and politics and everyone out there who seems to be like the th you know thrilled by all this extremes the meeting of the extremes okay well our job is to minimize the outward noise and to find the peace in our heart that's really our job right now it's weird because it's a shit show out there but in here is where it actually counts if it's a shit show in here then you're in trouble so the peace has to begin right here with every self and my self peace is not gonna be anything like yours it's gonna be different 
but we will meet in peace. And if somebody wants to meet in war, they can just go have their own stupid ass war, right? But we will generate peace from here, from the real start, from the real, where it really operates. Um, so, I don't know how I just got on that, but basically we're um, probably looking at some, uh, some kind of flu weirdness. Some people are anti-vaxxers, some people are pro-vaxxers, some people are just anti-chump vaxxers. You know, who knows what it is. Make the absolute bestest uh, decision. You know what they're giving the chump is basically vitamin D and zinc. Why don't you take that now? Uh, you know, they're giving him some of his cocktail drugs. Maybe they could just give him some of that stuff that he was whatever that crap was anyway I don't need to go into the details we all know the details all we're doing is just we're gonna hunker down for October in the winter we're gonna find our friends we're gonna find ourselves we're gonna find our friends after we find ourselves and meanwhile we've got some great stories coming up really fun stuff I'd love to talk about the Wollstonecrafts I love to talk about Godwin. She took her mother's name. I'm pretty sure. These are 18th century intellectuals. They're rich. They're posh. But they were kind of revolutionary. They were like Emma Goldman kind of people. But in the 18, uh, in the 17s, in the 18th century, London, England, wherever... Uh, just fascinating people. So we're going to learn a lot about that. Um, so it's going to be fun. Really fun. And I hope to see you throughout all that time. Because we'll probably be going through something similar. If not, then I'm, I, will, I, will, we, I will make sure you all know if plans are going to change. So I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I've got... Half a page, full page, full page, three pages. I just got like three. Oh, I've got three pages left. Okay. Oh, I've got three and a half. Three and a half, four pages left. Vindication? Cool. I don't know what that's about. Vindication? Do I know what that's about? Um, I might know what that's about. Uh, let's talk about that later, Susan. Um, we're going to focus right now on Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. I, I do love the Frederick March. If you have the chance at any time, maybe when you're, maybe when the weather gets worse or something, or for Halloween, you know, just fire up the 1930s Frederick March. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, even though they call him Dr. Jekyll, it's pre-code, and it's actually, it's risque, and it's, it's, they, they go out, they do it up, they have a fun time, and Stevenson gives you all the great clues, the grabbing of the throat, the, the grimace that Frederick March did with, uh, they did a, they would have him, like, it was a still, and they would, like, add makeup to him. Oh! Susan! <laughs> Thank you. Vindication, yes, of the rights of women. I understand what you're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I understand. I understand. Thank you, now I understand. <laughs> Look, I'm just spaced out. What do I know, man? I'm just here on the computer, you know? What do I know? Um... Okay, so any case, this is Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. If you have the time, the chance, if you can grab a copy of Frederick March's 1930 uh, uh, movie, it's a lot of fun. And they do a great job at encapsulating uh, the Yamura. 
all the effects and the chemicals and the transition, and they do a layering of the makeup in slow motion, which later on became uh, 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 the same kind of technology that they used for late, the Wolfman later on. Right? These guys are fun stuff, so hang with it. Keep keep coming back here because I got some cool stuff. Yeah, vindication on the rights of women. We're gonna talk about that, and we're gonna talk about the wolves and crafts and what they're about. Uh, actually, in the new year. <laughs> um, plenty of plenty of amazing stuff before then. Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. I was born in the year 18-something-something -something, to a large fortune, endowed besides with excellent parts, inclined by nature to industry, fond of the respect of the wise and the good among my fellow men, and thus, as might have been supposed, with every guarantee of an honorable and distinguished future. And indeed, the worst of my faults was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, such as made, such as has made the happiness of many, but such as I have found it hard to re reconcile with my imperious desire to carry my head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. Hence it came about that I concealed my pleasures. Oh, and here we go. This is very Victorian. So, public front, concealed pleasures. Because a lower class person is blamed for all manner of impropriety. However, these upper crust fellows... Uh, it's like... Falwell Jr., right? Where well, you think he's a respectable guy in a conservative outfit, and what's he doing but uh, being an intentional cuckold, right? And or engaging in acts. The Anthony Perkins Raymond, I don't know about the, uh, didn't know about the until. Uh, Oh, really? Anthony Perkins. Interesting. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Hmm. So, what is on the exterior of uh, an English gentleman or gentlewoman? Most of the gentlemen. Uh, was this veneer and inside they permitted themselves all kinds of licentious behavior so they practiced a kind of duality they practiced a kind of oppositeness and they just punished the poor Anyway, uh, I won't get too deeply into that, so we need to get into the story here. Wrap up the evening. So, Pierce desire to carry my head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. Hence, hence it came about that I concealed my pleasures. And that when I reached years of ref the years of reflection and began to look round me and take stock of my progress and position in the world, I stood already committed to a profound duplicity of life. Many a man would have even blazoned such irregularities as I was guilty of, but from the high views that I had set before me, I regarded and hid them with an almost morbid sense of shame. Okay. <laughs> we can start to peel this apart, right? 
Anyway, enough. You have everything you need here in the story to interpret it as you wish, and also enjoy the story. And that's exactly why I present these things to you. Because <laughs> I'm hoping that you will understand the wider cultural significance and even the modern cultural significance. Because they're still resonant today. They're still resonant. Okay? I'll read it again in case it didn't sink in, perhaps, the first time. Many a man would have even blazoned such irregularities as I was guilty of, but from the high views that I had set before me, I regarded and hid them with an almost morbid sense of shame. There's this duplicity between respectability and shame. Respectability and shame. What is so shameful? Perhaps a sexuality, perhaps a preference, perhaps a sexual preference, perhaps a, a drug addiction, perhaps everything that you can even imagine in the rich and anything that they could afford. They were doing to themselves, yes, even in the 18-something-somethings. And Stevenson didn't write that. I just said it, that's all. So, it was thus, rather the exacting nature of my aspirations than any particular degradation in my faults that made me what I was, and even a deeper trench than in the majority of men, severed in me those provinces of good and ill which divide and compound man's dual nature. In this case, I was driven to reflect deeply and inveterately on that hard law of life which lies at the root of religion and is one of the most plentiful springs of distress. Though so profound a double dealer, I was in no sense a hypocrite. Both sides of me were in dead earnest, and I was no more myself when I laid aside restraint and plunged in shame than when I labored in the eye of day at the furtherance of knowledge and belief of sorrow, and the relief of sorrow and suffering. And it chanced that the direction of my scientific studies, which led wholly toward the mystic and the transcendental, reacted and shed a strong light on this consciousness of the perennial war among my members with every day and from both sides of my intelligence, the moral and the intellectual, I thus drew steadily nearer to that truth, by whose partial discovery I have been doomed to such a, tre a dreadful shipwreck that man is not only one, but truly two. I say two, because the state of my own knowledge does not pass beyond that point. Others will follow. Others will outstrip me on the same lines, and I hazard the guess that man will be ultimately known for the mere polity of multifarious, incongruous, and independent denizens. I, for my part, from the nature of my life, advanced infallibly in one direction and in one direction only. It was on the moral side, and in my own person, that I learned to recognize the thorough and, per and primitive duality of man I saw that of the two natures that contended in the field of my consciousness, even if I could rightly be said to be either, it was only because I was radically both. And from an early date, even before the co course of my scientific discoveries had begun to suggest that the most naked possibility of such a miracle, I had learned to dwell with pleasure as a beloved daydream on the thought of the separation of these elements, if each if each, I told myself, could be housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. The unjust might go his way, delivered from the aspirations and remorse of his more upright twin, and the just could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path, doing the good things in which he found his pleasure and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of this extraneous evil. It was the curse of mankind that these incongruous faggots were thus bound together, that in the agonized womb of the consciousness, these polar twins should be continually struggling. How then were they disassociated? 
I was so far in my reflections when, as I have said, a sidelight began to shine upon the subject from the laboratory table. I began to perceive more deeply than it has ever yet been stated the trembling immateriality, the mist-like transience of this seemingly so solid body in which we walk attired. Certain agents I have found, certain agents I found to have the power to shake and pluck back that fleshly vestment, even as a wind might toss the curtains of a pavilion. For two good reasons, I will not enter deeply into the scientific branch of my confession. First, because I have been made to learn that the doom and burthen of our life is bound forever on man's shoulders, and when the attempt is made to cast it off, it but returns upon us with a more unfamiliar and evident, uh, with a more unfamiliar and more awful pressure. Second, because, as my narrative will make, alas, too evident, my discoveries were incomplete. Enough, then, that I had not only recognized that I own, enough, then, that I not only recognized my natural body from the mere aura and effulgence of certain of these powers that made up my spirit, but managed to compound a drug by which these powers should be dethroned from their supremacy, and a second form of countenance substituted, nonetheless natural to be, because they were the expression and bore the stamp of lower elements in my soul. Higher versus lower, higher and lower, huh? Anyway. I hesitated long before I put this theory to the test of practice. I knew well that I risked death for any drug that so potently controlled and shook the very fortress of identity might, by the least scruple of an overdose, or at the least inopportunity in the moment of exhibition, utterly blot out that immaterial tabernacle which I looked to it to change. But the temptation of a discovery so singular and profound at last came overcame the suggestions of a law. I had long since prepared my tincture. I purchased at once from a firm of wholesale chemists a large quantity of a particular salt, which I knew from my experiments to be the last ingredient required, and late one, uh, late one occurs at night, I compounded the elements, watched them boil, and smoked together in a glass, and when the ebullition had subsided with strong glow of courage, drank off the potion. The most racking pang succeeded, grinding in the bones, a deadly nausea and horror of the spirit that cannot be exceeded the hour of birth or death. Then these agonies began to swiftly to subside, and I came to myself as if out of a great sickness. There was something strange in my sensations, something indescribably new, and from its very novelty, incredibly sweet. I felt younger, lighter, happier body. Within, I was conscious of a heady recklessness, a current of disordered sensual images running like mill race in my fancy, a solution of the bonds of obligation, an unknown but not an but not an innocent freedom of the soul. I knew myself at the first breath of this new life to be more wicked, tenfold more wicked, sold a slave to my original evil, and the thought in that moment braced and delighted me like wine. I stretched out my hands, exulting in the freshness of these sensations, and in the act I was suddenly aware that I had lost in stature. There was no mirror at that date in my room. That which stands beside me as I write was brought here later. 
He was brought there later on and for the purpose, for the very purpose of these transformations. For the very purpose of these transformations. The night, however, was far gone into the morning. In the morning, black as it was, was nearly ripe for the conception of the day. The inmates of my house were locked in the most rigorous hours of slumber, and I determined, flushed as I was, with hope and triumph, to venture in my new shape as far as to my bedroom. I crossed the yard, wherein the constellations looked down upon me. I could have thought with wonder the first creature of that sort that their unsleeping vigilance had yet disclosed to them. I stole through the quarters, a stranger in my own house, and coming to my room, I saw for the first time the appearance of Edward Hyde. I must speak, I must hear speak by theory alone saying not that which I know, but that which I suppose to be most probable. The evil side of my nature, to which I had now transferred the stamping efficacy, was less robust and less developed than the good, which I had just opposed. Again, in the course of my life, which had been, after all, nine tenths of a life of effort, virtue, and control. It had been much less exercised and much less exhausted, and hence, I think, it came about that Edward Hyde was much, so much smaller, slighter, and younger than Henry Jekyll, even as good showed upon the countenance of the one. Evil was written broadly and plainly on the face of the other. Evil, besides evil besides which I must still believe to be the lethal side of man, had left, upon, had left on that body an imprint of deformity and decay, and yet when I looked upon that ugly idol in the glass, I was consciousness of no repugnance. I was conscious of no repugnance, rather a leap of welcome. And this, too, was myself. It seemed natural and human. In my eyes, it bore a livelier image of the spirit. It seemed more to express, it seemed more express and single than the imperfect and divided countenance I had been hitherto accustomed to call mine. And in so far, I was doubtless right. I have observed that when I wore the semblance of Edward Hyde, none could come near to me at first without a visible misgiving of the flesh. This, as I take it, was because all human beings, as we meet them, are commingled out of good and evil. And Edward Hyde, alone in the ranks of mankind was pure evil. So, that's it for tonight. I gotta go. I love you all. You guys are cool. Thank you for hanging out. It's been real. I'll get back to a lot of you, many of you, each and every one of you, on instant message, on the messenger. And uh, just thank you for hanging with me. We are going to finish uh, this next week. And um, I think that Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case it tells a lot of everything that was behind the story uh, that I have been trying to describe to you for three weeks. It's now been made overt uh, with... Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. It's so awesome that you're here, and I'm so glad you're enjoying this craziness. Um, there's more craziness to come. I have plenty of craziness for you to share. Lots. Uh, 
and I very much enjoy your company. I very much enjoy your company. Um, so that wraps this up. And Mike, thank you. You the man and Susan, yes, of course. Vindication. We're going to talk about all that more um, stuff coming up. Uh, cool stuff, fun stuff. Oh, Michael, you're still up. Oh, my gosh. Uh, thank you, Veronica. Yes, yes, yes. I will talk to you all soon. And um, for now, that's it. I'm done. Good night.